Hello, my name is Alec. I'm the technical manager at Quellfire. And in this video, I wanted to look at the considerations for MEP designers. There are a lot of factors that they need to be aware of. Over the last few years, you have seen a huge increase in what is happening on buildings with the design aspects, with the Building Safety Act, and also people starting to realize the sort of questions that they should have been asking for many years. So I'm gonna help you in this video cover about 20 different considerations that I'm um, seeing very often with MEP designers. Where you're uh, positioning your services for a building, there are gonna be points where they cross over fire separating elements, either walls or floors, and these are deemed compartmentation lines. These will need a penetration sealing system, such as what Quellfire offer. We do have specific rules and guidelines that have to be followed. This means that you can use our evidence, but it also stays in line with the guidance from the test standard that we have to work to. So with that in mind, let's look at the very first question, which is one that I have to go over lots and lots is, what are the spacing consideration for services within a builder's working connection opening? So when we're talking about spacings with the inside a builder's working connection opening, for example, a letterbox and a flexible wall that we have behind me, there are three spacing requirements that we need to consider. These are defined in section 13.7 of the BSEM 1366 part three service penetration um, standard. And they define that from the edge of the fire stop seal. So here we can see we've used quell stop HPE sealant to the edge of the aperture must be as tested or a minimum of 100 mil. If you've tested closer than 100 mil, then the service penetration fire stop seal can be closer. So for example, with a lot of quell fires details, not all, but a lot, um, we typically test the fire stop seal zero mil from the edge of the aperture, just to give us a wider scope of application. The next um, sort of spacing requirement, sort of as a good example here, is where you have services of the same type. So what we mean by that is two plastic ducts, you may have two cable carriers, two insulated metal pipes, services of the same type that are using the same ceiling penetration detail. So here with the plastic ductwork, we're using our QRS fire sleeve. And as you can see, we have the QRS position at zero mil. This is again, because this is the way we have tested it. We test it typically in what's known as the cluster method to our test standard. If you do not test it in this manner, again, the spacing is defined under section 13.7 of our test standard and this means a minimum of 100 mil. So again, it's important to know what fire um, stopping solution you're using because the spacing will be dedicated uh, by that. And the next spacing requirement is where you have services of a different type. So as you can see in this letterbox application here, it's a mixed penetration seal. We have a number of different service types. So from the edge of the QRS, the fire stop seal, to the edge of the fire stop seal here around this insulated metal pipe, that needs to be a prescribed distance. And again, it must be as tested or greater. And typically it's um, 100 mil in section 13.7. But with us at Quellfire, again, we've tested a minimum space for most of our details of 50 mil between fire stop seals. However, for MEPs that are watching this, you're very often gonna start running your routes, uh, services and that through the building long before a decision has been um, selected for the products. So you're not gonna be aware of Quellfire's minimum spacings or another manufacturer's minimum spaces. So what I've done, and you can contact me for more information, is provided three simple golden rules that work very well with most of Quellfire's information. It doesn't work with other manufacturers, so you need to check with them. But for our information, if you're working with us, typically what we would advise you to do is try and leave 50 mil spacing from the service to the edge of the aperture, 50 mil between services of the same type, and 100 mil between services of a different type. And then generally, with 99% of our details, even when we start to incorporate the fire stop seal, you've got enough tolerance built in that that spacing isn't going to um, go against the minimums of our uh, test standard. So that's sort of just a brief overview of the importance there. 
if for any reason you don't follow this, you'll find later on in projects, and it's happening more and more, that you'll be asked to go back and move them because it has to be in accordance with the test standard. So that brings us on to the next question, and that is, what is the 60-40 rule? There is a good rule of thumb, which is known as the 60-40 rule. What this typically means is that where you have, say, a penetration like this, uh, a multi-service seal here, where we've got gas pipes, conduits with cables, some heating type pipe work, for example, that, that opening is not filled with more than 60% services. So 40% typically should be filled with fire stopping materials. Now this section was part of the BSEN 1366 part three standard when it was the 2009 version. And that section um, went a little bit like this. Um, came under the section seal size and distances and it stated that the test results obtained using standard wall and floor configurations for penetration systems are valid for penetration size, brackets in term of linear dimensions, close brackets, equal to or smaller than tested, provided the total amount of cross sections of services, including insulation, does not exceed 60% of the penetration area. The working clearances are not smaller than the minimum working clearances as defined in Annex A, B, E and F using the test and a blank penetration seal for the maximum seal side desired was tested in addition. Obviously very complex, but the overall gist of that was that the, the seal should be only have 60% service. However, when we had the update in 2021, it was quickly uh, realized that for a lot of manufacturers who've only tested in certain uh, ways, when you incorporate that 100 mil spacing as per section 13.7, you needed a lot more than 60 um, 40% fire mat uh, material inside the seal. So the standard has changed and it now states the following. Section 13.4.2 of the BSEN 1366 Part 3 2021 Fire Resistant Test Standard for Service Penetration states that the total number of services, that's pipes, cables, conduits, trunking, etc., tested within a specific penetration seal may be increased without restriction so long as the distances between the services and between the services and the aperture edge are not smaller than the minimum distances, C13.7, used in the test. Subject to other rules in this standard, this rule does not apply for single service penetration seals which form an annular space. So basically what that means is now that it's more vital than ever to know what testing has been done. So again, Qualifier, because service penetrations are our forte, we have done a number of different solutions. So for example, very often or not, you'll have a lot of gas pipes, as you can see here. So we've tested this in a manner that will allow you to have a large number amount, uh, amount of pipe with a uh, HP annulus around the collective. Obviously, this is subject to practicality and installability as well. But you can come to us, we can have a look and advise on what our minimums are. But again, what I would advise for your MEP um, design work is think about the end user. First of all, the MEP has got to be installed. So this could be quite hard to install. But the next stage is they've got to practically get around this to install our products. So again, you need to think of a design that works for everyone. So this brings us on to the next question, which was briefly just sort of mentioned in that last statement from the standard. And that is about the spacing considerations for direct to wall seals. So what did I mean by direct to wall seals? Typically, there are gonna be times where you might just have one or a few little services, like a bundle, where you're not gonna make a formed or framed and lined opening, as we call it, a builder's working connection. You're gonna be using, hopefully, a small penetration with what we call a direct to wall seal or direct to floor, if it's a floor application. But these, again, have specific rules. So from the edge of the aperture, for example, here we've got a conduit with cables, to the edge of another aperture, the section 13.7 is quite clear that there should be a minimum space of 100 mil. However, as we advise quite heavily, you still need to speak to the wall manufacturer, especially with flexible walls, to ensure that they are happy with that minimum space between apertures, because they may advise that you need a greater distance. And if they advise that, it is their evidence that trumps what we have tested but otherwise the minimum is 100 mil even when we're talking about rigid walls such as block work or concrete it's still advisable to check 
with your structural engineer that that 100 mil of block work or concrete is going to be sufficient in between the apertures because if that breaks away you're making two small holes into one larger hole and then that detail is going to fail that brings us on to the very next question which will be what are the first service support spacing requirements a very big and important consideration for MEPs is what's known as the first service support dis, uh, spacing and distant requirements. Okay, when it comes to fire um, stopping, the first service support, such as the ones here, must be as tested or closer. And this is in accordance with section 13.5 of the test standard. And that states the following. In walls, the distance from the surface of the separating element to the nearest support position for services slash cable carriers shall be the same as the minimum distance tested or less. Obviously nice and simple, but I know for MEPs, we sometimes get an argument that, well, the manufacturer of say the pipe or the trunking system, they allow service supports to be spaced out one meter you know, 500 mil, et cetera, et cetera. And this is well and good for that. But when we're talking about firewalls, there is a concern of what happens when these service supports get attacked by the fire. Steel, for example, this is unprotected, loses a lot of its structural strength in a fire when it reaches a certain temperature. And in a typical fire, this temperature is reached very, very quickly. If you actually see the end of one of the fire tests that we do, you will see the difference on the fire side of how these service supports look. So it's vital that the service supports are positioned as tested or closer. Now for quell fire, most of our details, not all, but 99.9% .9 are 400 mil or less. There are a few occasions where we actually need the service support to be slightly further away. And there are some older details where it might be slightly closer. So it's very important you check our detailed drawings. Most of the time it's 400 mil. It will always be listed in the bottom right hand corner of our detailed drawings. And you can always speak to our technical team to just double check as well. But it is vital that you have this. And it is the same on both sides of the fire separating element uh, for the walls and stuff. So make sure you check that as well. Also, when we're talking about first service support, so you can see here, they must be non-combustible. You may have a single cable or a conduit like this, and you may feel a plastic zip tie will be okay. This isn't okay. It's not how it's tested. It must be non-combustible and meet the requirements of the BSEM 1366 Part 3 test standard. If you need more information on that, please reach out to me and I'll uh, help you best I can. So the next consideration we're gonna be looking at is what is known as cable conduits. So very often or not for the MEPs, you may be using what's known as a cable conduit or a duct is which might be known, uh, which makes it easy to pass cables through um, a, a wall or a floor, etc. Now this is great, but unfortunately conduits have a specific test section in, in the standard. So we have to test them. Um, it's not as simple as just saying, oh, it's a plastic pipe. You can use the same detail. You have to do specific testing on the types of conduit. Qualify have done a number of different tests. We've done tests on the one here, for example, this is sort of flexible PP conduit. We've done up to sort of 63 mil in some applications. We've got metal conduits, flexible metal conduits, uh, rigid plastic things. But the way they're tested is in accordance with that section in the standard. So it has to include certain cables, um, you have to have an empty one. There's ways and means that we have to test this. It's not as simple as just using plastic pipe data. So it's very important for the MEPs when you're selecting your uh, conduit or duct for your cables that in the design stage, you find one that's got the appropriate test evidence. Again, this is really important at that early engagement stage to reach out and we can explain the difference. So where you might want a 50 mil conduit, for example, I would advise to use something like the flexible PP because we have evidence for that. Whereas with a galvanized rigid steel conduit, we only have currently solutions up to 25 mil. And there are those slight differences that can quickly cause issues later on in a project. So as we're on the topic of cables, the next consideration I wanna discuss is what's known as cable carriers. So more often than not, um, your cables are gonna be positioned on what's known as cable carriers. And there's a number of different types. Typically, we would test a cable tray such as this or a cable ladder. 
Now, both of those will cover a cable basket, so they would fall under the same category choice. But there are other, obviously other choices like trunking, conduits, which I mentioned in the other question, etc. So it's very important when you're uh, speaking to, uh, say, us at Man of, um, Quellfire, we know exactly what cable carrying size that you've got because there are going to be different uh, solutions for each. And sometimes a basket is more appropriate than a tray due to the fire resistance uh, uh, requirements. The next consideration we're going to look at as we're diving into cable carriers is um, the use of rock fiber insulation. There are going to be some requirements for a very high fire resistance rating. Typically, you're looking at the two hour or four hour ratings that might be required. Now, when we're talking about fire resistance, it's not just trying to stop the fire from coming from one side to the other. The big factor for service penetrations is stopping heat. And that's the heat traveling down the service itself. So as you can imagine, with cables on cable carriers, there's a lot of copper, there's a lot of steel, and these are very good conductors of heat. So in some scenarios where you may require EI120, so that's two hours integrity and insulation, or even four hours, you may have to use foil-faced rock fiber, such as this here, that we wrapped around the cable carrier and the cables for a prescribed distance. Now, this is really important for MEPs to be aware of this because where this happens, this can have a detrimental effect on your cables and how they function. And obviously, when we're looking at these scenarios, it's not just about the fire stopping. We've got to make sure that the actual services themselves are doing their intended use. So this is, again, really important to know that in certain areas, this may be incorporated and you'll have to think about this. In. So the next consideration we're going to be looking at is pipe lagging. So very often or not, especially when we're talking about boosted cold water supplies or hot water um, through buildings, the pipes are going to be lagged or have pipe lagging, pipe insulation, etc. Now, again, as a manufacturer of passive fire protection products, it is vital that we have certain information so we can provide you an appropriate detail. First of all, we need to know what the pipe is. Obviously, just behind me here, you can see copper pipes. But obviously, now we are starting to see things like MLC, multi-layer composite pipes. You could have steel. It's very important that we know the material because materials do react differently in fire. The next thing that we will need to know is the insulation type that you wish to use. As you can see here, we've got three examples. We've got foil face rock fiber. We've got uh, phenolic type insulation here. And this one here is Armaflex uh, type insulation as well. Now, these three insulations have all got tested solutions. We've tested different thicknesses, but they may require different seals. For example, foil face rock fiber can use a seal sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't need one. Quell coil goes around the uh, phenolic insulation Armaflex. We have HPE solutions. Depending on the application, it depends on what fire stop seal is required. Thickness is also very important. For example, here, phenolic insulation. It's a very good pipe lagging system for, for that thermal um, performance. However, there's only certain thicknesses that we test. Most manufacturers have only tested 40 mil thickness. We have a couple of applications where we've gone as thick as 75 mil. But it's very important you let us know what thickness you'd like because we can advise accordingly. Obviously, in a lot of places now, we're seeing a lot of 50 mil. So this is vital that you're using the right appropriate detail. Just gonna break into this video just quickly here um, whilst editing it. Obviously, it is an important subject. Was advised it's getting a bit long and we wanted to make sure that our audience stays invested into this because it's very important. So this is gonna be the end of part one. Part two is gonna be coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, so make sure that you've liked, subscribed, hit that little notification bell so you can be um, aware of when the next part come out. But if you have any questions on what we've covered here now, please let us know. Let us know if you've got any other consideration you want us to think about, but the second part is gonna be coming out in the next few weeks as well. So just stay tuned for that. Thank you.